today's speaker is actually someone you've probably seen around and hopefully had a chance to talk to. Uh, Tom Novak is visiting with us this semester, currently occupying Tom Goodnight's office. Uh, you've seen him. Uh, he is a colleague from the University of California, Riverside, where he co-directs the Center on Internet Marketing. And I will leave him the time. The title has changed somewhat, I see, from here to here, so. Well, the title changes on a daily, daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> you can read the correct title rather than have me read the old one. Uh, Thanks, Larry. OK, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed the seminars I've been coming to this fall. I'm really glad to have a chance to uh, present. So as Larry said, the title is a bit of ambiguity, but there's a, a couple things I'm going to talk about. There's a research project called Recognition Accuracy, Context and Content Effects in Visual Text-Based Environments. Uh, this is a project that I've done in Second Life with my co-author, Francesca Massara, who's at IULM in Italy, who I really need to mention first, since the project's about Second Life, or it's partly filled in Second Life, I also met my co-author in Second Life. <laughs> and uh, so we met there virtually, we collaborated virtually for about a year. Eventually, he came out to Riverside, spent a semester visiting. Uh, but I just think it's very appropriate that if you do a project in the virtual world, you need to co-author that. So in addition to talking about this one project, which I want to go into a fair amount of detail on, because it also gives a sense of how to do a research project in Second Life, I'm going to talk about the environment I've set up, which is called eLeft City in Second Life. That is a platform that we've developed over the past three years for doing consumer research projects within Second Life. Uh, so I'm going to start, take maybe about 10 minutes, and talk about the eLeft City project. It's kind of the broader umbrella platform. And just talk very quickly about a couple of different projects we're doing here to give a sense of what we're using this for. And then spend most of the time talking about this recognition accuracy project. Basically, how accurately do people remember information that they see in the virtual world versus the versus a web browser, uh, different types of online environments, depending on what that information is. OK, so first, the eLeft City project. <coughs> virtual worlds. There's lots of virtual worlds. I'm sure most people in here are familiar with at least some of these things. There's hundreds and hundreds, probably a 1,000 different virtual worlds that exist for all sorts of market segments. A lot of them are for kids. I'm going to focus more on the ones that are for adults. But since there's so many for kids, what I'm saying now is going to become even more relevant in the coming decade as kids mature and they, they, they grow into these uh, virtual world platforms. So there's lots of virtual worlds. Uh, the one that I'm working in is Second Life. Just a quick show of hands. How many people have Second Life Avatar? And a few. OK. <laughs> all right, so uh, virtual worlds. Now, all of these worlds um, share some things in common. So they share some things in common structurally. They have some characteristics. They're persistent shared spaces. They're graphical 2D, increasingly 3D environments, very realistic. They're interactive. They're social. The environment's experience. They're very, very visual environments, which becomes important for the recognition <coughs> accuracy research. Examples I'm talking about, Second Life, Hypey Hive, there, uh, Twinity, uh, Blue Mars, adult-oriented worlds. Uh, Second Life is a particular interest because it has a whole fully functioning social system to it, along with an economy. So it's, a, it's the closest we can come to a simulation of the real world in, in many ways. Now, from a consumer behavior perspective, I'm a marketer. I focus on online consumer behavior. What's interesting is how behavior in virtual worlds um, matches up in many ways with behavior in real world. There's been a lot of research that's looked at parallels of real world behavior, such as do people make eye contact, how far apart do men and women stand from each other in real world versus virtual worlds, and they find a lot of parallels. Now, Demetrius noted you have to take this with a grain of salt. It depends on the uh, specific behaviors and context. You can't assume it. But in a lot of cases, you find this relationship. There's also reciprocal relationships of what people do in virtual worlds affects what they do in the real world and vice versa. So from a consumer behavior perspective, it's very, very important to understand what's going on in virtual world because of the relationships, the real world um, behavior. OK, so ELEF City Project. With this idea of understanding consumer behavior in mind, the concept for ELEF City, which was started in 2007, was to use the metaphor of a live, work, play community. OK, so why a live, work, play community? The idea was to try to set up an environment that would encourage people to, to 
basically behave in lots of different ways. So there was a live aspect. We would have residential areas where people would set up virtual homes, virtual apartments. There was a work aspect. Um, people would participate in research. So the work is they participate in the research studies. We compensate them. In addition, um, we have a, a panel of 6,000 Second Life users who signed up to participate in our research. So the work is kind of what it sounds like. It's, it's work research function, functions. And then we also wanted to encourage play behaviors. So we have a design center, have a couple of nightclubs in Second Life. They're on a bit of a hiatus, but for about a year I was running two nightclubs in Second Life. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I admit it. And this is mainly through a, a, a Second Life resident who was my club director. She hired two assistant managers. They hired, they were really busy. They hired 12 hosts and hostesses. And for a grand total of $60 a week in real currency, I supported the staff of about 15 people for close to a year. So um, that was the play aspect. The idea was to get people to do things that weren't work related, weren't uh, you know, kind of living related. So to encourage a whole variety of types of behaviors. Um, in terms of the development, I did wanted to at least acknowledge my primary developer, Cesari Ostrowski, also known as Cesari Fish in Second Life. Um, he and I got to know each other really well from 2007 to 2008, setting up U.S. City. We had probably two to three hour calls, two to three times a week for about six months. So um, that was the, the main development process. And in, in thinking about this, I also thought it would be um, just useful background to, to get a sense of the cost background. It was kind of a, a pie chart of what, what it cost, where the cost went. So um, these colors here are the um, 15, the um, land rental, that's the money you pay to Lind Linden Lab to run, to uh, basically lease the server space to operate um, the, uh, the Second Life simulations. And Linden Dollar Incentives, this is real money that I used to buy virtual currency and it was then used to provide incentives for people to join my survey panel and to participate in experimental studies. And that together was about one third. The bulk of it is that anything else is labor. So the developer, the research development infrastructure, student workers are about two thirds. Uh, and so th this is actually the, ex the, the real expense is labor to keep all of this going. Okay, so three years later, live, work, play. What happened with live, work, play? It's kind of a rough schematic. It was turned out to be mainly work in terms of what, was, uh, what people actually did here. You know, part of it is we bit off a little bit more than we can chew. There's just so much that you can do. You have to direct your resources to a certain place. We focused on setting up experimental shops, developing this panel, fielding surveys, running a series of different experiments, setting up data capture software so that the people that came to the clubs, we could track who they were and actually do some modeling of, of visit behavior. Um, so the play was secondary. The live really never took off. So you have to direct your resources, and this is what it came to. I got a couple papers that were distributed as kind of as background. The work aspect, just to emphasize, there, there were a lot of things that uh, we developed as a research infrastructure. Not all of it is still in place. Some of it comes and goes. But the green part here, the EVF City panel, this is one of the main functions. Um, the, the idea is to get a group of Second Life residents who agree to participate in your research. So as I said, about um, 6,000 people have agreed to participate. <clears throat> when they sign up, they're, they're paid a small incentive to sign up. We, we invite them to studies over email or instant message. They can participate in the studies and then they're compensated afterwards. So we have a whole system for building this panel. We build in a number of research studies and then we have observational data. So a lot of our efforts, and it's described in more detail in that uh, background paper, we're setting up a, a, a research infrastructure to build these studies. Okay, second life is visual. So let's think in terms of pictures instead of words here. Um, you can only, you can visit Second Life in uh, uh, um, you can visit Second Life in CE Left City, but this is kind of an overview of the property. Um, it's hard to get some of the details here, but this is a, a, a an annotated picture of it. So it's 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 like a little city. So the idea was to have a, a, an immersive environment that people would come to and explore. Even now, um, I'm not doing anything. I haven't done anything to promote it. I got a couple hundred. A couple hundred unique avatars came last week and explored. I'm not sure why they're even coming now, um, but they're still coming and exploring because we're not actively doing anything. We're not actively running the club, but the people are still checking it out. So you can see there's shops, there's one of the dance clubs, there's another dance club, there's housing. 
Uh, and then there's research labs. That one there that I'm pointing at is where I'll show you. We fielded one of our studies, the Recognition Accuracy Study. It's actually fielded in that virtual building there. So it's like a little city to encourage people to um, really get into the project when they come. OK, there's uh, just some screenshots. Uh, these are a bit dim. This is an auditorium in Elab City. I've done some lectures here for some of my colleagues at other universities. It's a little disconcerting when you're lecturing to a room full of avatars. You're not really sure who's behind the avatar. It generally works pretty well, um, but uh, it, it's hard. It's harder than talking to like you guys in a real room. Much more difficult. Um, this is the design center we have. There's an artist, Peter Stanek. He does uh, flash-based pop art. Um, we have a show of his works in that city, part of the play aspect. There's an apartment. This is one of my apartments. You know, maybe I'm the only person really who likes the apartment aspect. Like, I don't know, it's just something about me. I kind of like to play around with the stuff and uh, see what it looks like. And then my dark side, I set up a basement apartment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, uh, yeah, I, I haven't found other people as, as interested in this aspect. So maybe have too many of my biases coming in about how exciting the live part would be to people. Okay. The nightclub, however, was really popular. This is our Alcatraz Club, which is modeled after Alcatraz. And this club, I stopped financially supporting it, but the people running it like it so much, they're, they're still coming in and doing it anyway. I'm letting them still use it. They're inviting people in a few times a week. And then, this is uh, just make one last example here. And this is one of our sign-up kiosks. When people come into Elap City scattered around, there's these kiosks. This is now we move to a system called the Express Panel. You touch this, and basically you, you, you're entered into a drawing to win a certain amount of virtual currency in a week. Uh, the prize is fairly substantial for Second Life uh, 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 purposes. Um, but uh, by, by touching this, you, you join the panel, and then we have access to you for um, uh, inviting you to subsequent research studies. We also do classified ads in Second Life. There's a whole marketing machine that we use to kind of get people to come here and join the panel and things like that. Okay. What do we use all this for, other than me going into my apartments and playing with my apartments? Um, in terms of research, here's some of the projects that we're doing. One will just call this the shopping study. One of the things that I'm interested in is um, do people purchase um, products either individually? So you have women's tops and women's bottoms. You have a budget of 200 linden to spend. That's less than a dollar in real currency, but that's about what these things would cost in Second Life. So are you going to spend it on an individual item, or are you going to spend it on something that's already been pre-selected? So an outfit that costs 200. OK, so what we're doing is setting up different stores. Um, there's been some research in uh, consumer behavior that's shown that if the ceiling height is high, like it is in this room, people tend to categorize more broadly, think more creatively. When the ceiling height is low, people categorize more narrowly. And there's actually um, you know, been some studies that have moved the ceiling heights up and down and found that. Well, that's hard to do in a store. It's easier to do in Second Life. So one thing we're doing is having a um, store with a low ceiling height versus a high ceiling height. Experiment I'm hoping to run fairly soon is to then put these different products in. You can buy them either individually or already selected in outfits. And our premise is that in these high ceiling height stores, people will go for the pre-selected outfits. When the ceiling is low, they're going to think more narrowly and pick these out individually. So that, that's one example of something you can do in Second Life. It's going to be a lot harder to do in the real world, and we're hoping the results, in this case, generalize to the real world. Um, this is a second project. I call this the spatial click stream. Um, with web server data, of course, you have a click stream in terms of people's uh, visit behavior to websites. With Second Life, you have X, Y, Z coordinate locations over time. So every single minute, we take a snapshot of who is in Elab City. So we know who is where. And these little red dots represent avatars. And so you can see they tend to cluster, like the dance club is pretty popular. This one is here, too. Um, there's some locations that are popular, some are not. So we're looking at things like, does the presence of other avatars around you affect your likelihood to come back and return and visit? Does it affect how long you stay? Um, does it depend if they're in a social area or a non-social area? So we're looking at these sorts of questions based upon um, what we call the spatial clickstream behavior, um, indications of who is visited and when. And then last, uh, this is a more of a survey-based project. I'm also very interested in why people use Second Life, why people use also social media in general. 
And so we have a project going on where um, we've asked Second Life residents, why do you use Second Life? And we've, we've identified a long list of hundreds and hundreds of different goals people have. And what we're looking at is the roles they adopt to pursue a particular goal. So you might have the goal, I use Second Life to just pass the time. But when people want to pass the time, some people do it by creating content, by building. Other people pass the time by connecting with other people, by socializing. Others pass the time by just kind of wandering around and consuming. So you adopt a role pursuing the goal, um, and so what we're really trying to understand is what drives you to adopt certain roles, to understand why people use social media. So that's just kind of some sense of the sorts of things we're looking at. And then, of course, the fourth project is the one I want to talk about today in more detail, this one called Recognition Accuracy. Okay, so I'm going to get more of a kind of a traditional marketing consumer behavior presentation of this topic here. So I want to kind of get into really more details what, what this particular study is about, some of the theory behind it, and how we did the study. Okay, so here's the motivation. We've got a couple of contexts. We've got a flat context. We have a web browser, two-dimensional web browser. And then we have a three-dimensional virtual world context. Okay? Within those contexts, you have content. Now, here I have a text ad in the web browser context. And I've got a picture ad in the virtual world. I could have mixed them up. I could have had a picture ad in the web browser, I get a text ad in the virtual world, and right away that suggests some basic questions. Okay, so one is how accurately will people recognize the same content, either text or picture, presented in different contexts, either in a virtual world or in a web browser? And does the answer depend on what people are asked to do with the content? Okay, so this kind of motivates the whole problem. Um, you, you're, you see a billboard, you're in the real world, the billboard has images, it has text, what are you more likely to remember? So how does the context affect whether or not you remember having seen pictures or words uh, as content? Okay, there's some theory, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I wanted to introduce some of this. Um, there's some theory that's useful for understanding um, why this all works. So there's the type of thinking, the amount of thinking, and then the cost of thinking. Okay? So type of thinking, and this I think is a really important idea for understanding people in virtual worlds. Um, there's uh, visual and verbal thinking styles. People think in both ways. There's amount of thinking, there's that's a level of elaboration. How much do you think? You see something, you know, you see a billboard, you think about it, but uh, not at all, have a low level of elaboration. Or you think about what it means, uh, you, you, you have a higher level of thinking. And then this idea of cost of switching. So there's um, three aspects to the framework. Okay, visual and verbal processing styles. So I've done some work on this uh, as well. Um, the idea here is that, as I said, there's this distinction between verbal and visual processing. There's a lot of research in psychology over the past two, three decades that looks looked at dual processing styles. The different theories have many, many different names. You know, rational thinking versus experiential thinking, <coughs> discursive versus uh, imagery thinking, system two versus system one. For our purposes, we're going to call it verbal versus visual processing. So the verbal processing, this is an iceberg. This is thinking we're aware of. It's above the surface. Um, it happens with greater effort, slower processing, it's more controlled. Visual thinking is more experiential. It's the part of the iceberg that's below the surface. It just kind of emerges from with, without actively thinking. You don't really think when you think visually. You're not that aware of it. It just um, happens more below the surface. So there's two different thinking styles. Now, where this becomes important for that, that example I showed is that um, the context, whether you're in a virtual world or in a web browser, as well as the content, both induce or favor certain ways of thinking. So the virtual world is a context. That really favors visual processing. If you go into a visual uh, environment like Second Life, um, what you're doing is you navigate there, you're orienting yourself in space, you're, the, 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 the space changes as you move about, it's constantly shifting. You're not rationally figuring out how do I get from point A to point B, you're just kind of intuitively, visually thinking and maneuvering yourself in that environment. And so it favors visual processing. Um, web browsers, of course, there's, there's websites that are very, very visual, but I'm thinking of more of survey-type sites. So sur when, when you have someone do a consumer <coughs> survey, they go to something like Qualtrics, it's pretty text-based, 
And it really in encourages the verbal processing. You're not thinking visually, you're thinking verbally, you're thinking more analytically. Now at the same time, when you have picture content, you think visually. When you have text content, you think verbally. So what happens is that these ways of thinking can either match or not match. So for example, you can have a match, you can be in a virtual world, encourages visual processing. You see pictures, that encourages visual processing. The types of thinking from context and content are both consistent. So they can either match or they can mismatch. All right, so why is that important? The reason it's important is that the matching and mismatching, in terms of whether you remember having seen something, um, the matching or mismatching um, is a function of how much you're actually thinking. All right, so if you have a low level of elaboration, so I show you a picture of a desk. There's a picture of a desk. And they show you a bunch of other pictures, and later on I show you a picture and say, did you see this one before? You haven't thought about it much at all. So in this case, when you have a low elaboration task, um, your subsequent recollection that you've seen something is increased if um, there is a mismatch between the, the thinking used for the, for the um, content and the thinking used in the context. And so basically, if you think about it intuitively, this means that the, pic the, the picture of this desk would stand out a lot more if it was shown like in a newspaper than if it was, it was shown in some sort of a, a, a 3D virtual world. On the other hand, if you start thinking more, if I show you a picture of a desk, like here, at the bottom, okay, and then I say, okay, um, now, categorize the desk into one of these colors that you think best describes the desk overall. So here you're thinking visually, you're elaborating on the desk, you're thinking about what the desk means. In this case, if I later ask you, do you remember seeing this desk, um, since it's a higher elaboration, if you did all this in a virtual world, um, you would remember it better than if um, you did it in an uh, environment that wasn't consistent. So the idea is that the match or mismatch, match or mismatch depends on how much you're thinking. Okay, then we can ask one other question, like, why is that the case? And there's one other bit of theory. And we have this chart here. Um, this is the idea of cost of switching. So there's a blue curve here. And the blue curve basically says, when you aren't thinking much, it's, it's easy to switch back and forth between this verbal approach and the visual approach. It's a low cost of switching. When you start to think a lot, you get locked in. You start thinking visually, you're, you're, you're thinking you know, about how to categorize this, uh, this desk into this color. It's, it uses up your, your, your brain resources, and you can't really switch back and forth between the different processing zones. OK, so the idea here is that this, this idea, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this, this theory will support why the mismatch occurs when processing is low, and why the match works best when you're thinking harder. And then there's also the space at the bottom where if um, <coughs> Uh, there's really nothing works well that um, when uh, you, you see something and there's you know, time to register, you have to, there's kind of a boundary <coughs> condition where nothing is going to work. Okay, so I, I'm kind of rushing through this. This is a lot of background theory here, but I didn't want to just kind of take, on, take it on faith when I put these hypotheses up. I want to give you some sense of where they came from. Okay, so um, we can describe the study that we did then to look at recognition accuracy. Um, we've tested a series of hypotheses. The first two are really straightforward. A lot of research in psychology has shown that people remember pictures better than they remember words. It's called the picture superiority effect. This is basically a you know, face validity that we need to find this uh, in our study in order to, to feel convinced that we're, we're doing things correctly. Um, signal strength, in this case, we're operationalizing this as how long you see a picture or how long you see a word, ranging from a half a second to one and a half seconds. So the longer you see something, the better you should remember it, and, and we should find that too. So these are kind of obvious things, and they're kind of basically checks and we're doing things correctly. The third hypothesis is the key one. So this just puts in a sentence what I've been saying. For a low elaboration recognition task, I show you something, I show you 40 different images, and then I show you later those images, and I ask uh, uh, if you've seen them or not, and I mix in, in some things you haven't seen before. Um, the mismatch between the context and content will result in better accuracy. So that's what basically means in the virtual world. You're going to remember text better, uh, and you're not going to remember images as well. But in the web browser, you remember the images better, and you won't remember the, the, the words as well. The mismatch, mismatch helps. And then some qualifying conditions, only when there's enough resources available for processing, 
And then we have this uh, boundary condition where there's not enough resources, nothing's going to work well at all. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the design and then talk about how the experiment was done in second light. This is a two by two by two design. So we have two different contexts. We have the virtual world, we send people into second light, or we send them to a web browser. They were looking at either picture or word content. So there are two different types of content. And when they saw it, they saw it either for a very short period of time, half a second, or a longer period of time, one and a half seconds. Okay, so that was all pre-tested to come up with those levels. The stimuli, here's some examples at the bottom. Uh, we have the sweater, a nice picture of a leg, a desk, a little <laughs> truck there. There's 40 of these. There's actually a very nice collection of images that's useful for these sorts of purposes. It was developed uh, 30 years ago by Snodgrass and Vanderwerk, and a couple of guys recolored these things later um, in uh, 2004. These, uh, uh, we came up with a set of um, images, 60 pictures or words <coughs> that were Pretty, uh, pretty homogeneous, pretty consistent in terms of people tend to remember them all the same. They have high name agreements, which means when people look at this, when you look at this thing, pretty much everyone agrees it's a truck. It's not ambiguous. And so when you show the word truck, the picture truck, people are thinking the same thing. Okay, so the set of 60 pictures that we've come up with uh, to start. Um, we use a standard memory recognition app. So the, we first presented a slideshow. So you would see 40 um, pictures uh, at the, in the first, uh, first time period. And then after you've seen them, you'll see another 40. Now the second time, you'll see 20 from the first set that you've seen already. Those are the ones that you've studied. And then you'll see 20 blue ones that are distractors. All right? And then you're asked the second time, each time you're presented, do you remember seeing this from before? So you either will see the pictures or you'll see the words a slideshow, and then the test of whether or not we recognize it. Okay. This is a demo of what the fast condition looks like. You wouldn't see both of these. You would see either the pictures or the words. These are coming in half a second apart. This was administered either in Second Life or it was administered um, in a web browser. So these are going by pretty quickly. Um, now, in Second Life also, that's about as fast as you can do. If you try to go any faster, things become blurry. They don't load fast enough. This is as far as we can push it. Okay, so people saw these slideshows, and then they saw, and then one at a time, each image, and were asked, do you recognize it? Ha half of them were things they saw the first time, and I'm sure you recognize, you remember all those things you just saw, right? It's, like, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's difficult. You have to really, really focus and pay attention. Um, people actually got 70, 80% of them correct, though. Can I ask a quick question about that? Mm -hmm. So what kind of, um, when people are making mistakes, are they, more likely to say, I didn't see that, or to say yes when they didn't see it? That's a good question. So that, that's where the whole idea of signal detection theory comes right. in, because it's the idea of the false positives, false, false alarms. Negative. Yes. And yes. Um, there's what, what, we're, what we are particularly interested in are basically the false memories. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. people saying they saw something when they actually really didn't. So um, I'm interested in overall accuracy, but also in particular, that particular error, um, it really reflects the lack of thinking. This tendency to say yes to everything, you have lots of false memories. If you're more conservative, um, then you have uh, fewer false memories. So um, I'll get to it in a second, but there's one of the dependent measures actually gets at that. But yeah, you're right, there's a lot of ways to look at this. There's a lot of ways people can make errors. Okay, so that was what people did. Um, this, is, this, this is a lot of technical details here. I'm not going to really emphasize this too much, but if you're familiar with signal detection theory, it's a nice way of capturing mathematically what's going on in people's minds. So um, the idea is that um, there is a, a signal distribution, which is the stimuli you're studying the first time, 40 stimuli that you all saw in that slideshow. That's the signal distribution. Okay, the second time, you're seeing some things you haven't seen before. So the signal strength, the strength of the distractors in your mind should be less. They shouldn't stand out as much. So we can mathematically represent that, and we can look at the, the, the separation between those two distributions for each person, and that's a measure of sensitivity. That's a measure of whether or not people separate stuff they really did see in the first place from stuff they really didn't. And so there's a separation there, that's the sensitivity. And then, um, Andrew, to your question, the um, decision bias data gets at people's tendency to either say yes or no. So we're actually looking at this uh, parameter beta, which in plain English is a decision style that's either liberal or conservative. And so we're looking for um, a decision style that is 
conservative, or you're more likely to say no. A lot of research has found that represents more thoughtful thinking. Someone who says, yeah, I saw it, yeah, I saw it, yeah, I saw it, they're, they're sloppy in their thinking. All right, so those people um, are not as careful, they're not as accurate. The people that are saying no, um, it's, it's a more accurate way of thinking. What's FA mean? Um, FA is false alarms. Oh. Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm not going to go into this, because this I don't want to give a lecture on sample detection theory. But um, the, the, the premise here is that um, this, this idea of uh, false uh, of liberal versus conservative decision styles is something we can capture in one of our important outcomes, along with the overall performance, just in terms of whether or not you can separate it into minds, things you sought for versus things you didn't. And, uh, you know, think, and then our manipulations, for example, how long you were presented with it, clearly you should do a better job if you saw something longer than if it zipped past the way it did here at, at half a second. If you had a chance to see it for a couple seconds, you would remember it better and there would be a bigger separation. Okay, so in terms of how these were done, now the web browser context is pretty straightforward. We email our people in our Second Life panel, and um, at that time we, we, we stopped capturing email addresses. I had an incident with 600 avatars from Argentina who signed up and flooded my panel, so I had to do things a different way. Um, they even set up a bot where they were direct. It, 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 it got really messy. I had to get Lyndon Lab involved in this thing for a while to close it down. So I, I changed the way they might be. If you, if you start doing things in Second Life where you give money in yeah, some way, yeah. people are going to find a way to game the system. Exactly. Yeah. That happened to me in the first week. I had somebody come in and register with a hundred different avatars and get lots of money. So I changed my system to something else. And, and then these people in Argentina figured, figured a way around it. So I had to do something else. But at that time, I had email addresses. So I emailed my um, Second Life panelists, a sample of them, and I directed them to a web browser. And so in the web browser, they see the slideshow like you did. Then they ask for, we were asked afterwards for each of the 20 of the slides they saw, plus 20 new ones. Do you remember this or not? And then we asked a bunch of other questions. OK, so you can build that study in the web browser and no big deal. And they respond by clicking? Yeah, like here, uh, did you yes, see no. that before? Yes, no. And I'm not going to, there's also a don't know, which actually makes it more accurate. But, but then they control the amount of time for the for On the, the second response. pass, they do, yeah. So, and they don't take that long. They want to go through this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they go through it. But we actually have how long they spend, too. OK. Now, in Second Life, just to give you a sense of how this works, I, I'm, I think this is interesting how you do the research in Second Life. So I think it's worth it uh, to take a quick look at how that's done. It also gives you a sense of how the environment is really a visual environment. Remember this idea, the context basically primes a way of thinking. So the context of Second Life gets you to think visually that part of your brain kicks in. And then that's the reason it's important whether you see visual or text content. OK, so people are directed from Second Life. This is the building I pointed out on the slide earlier. This is our research lab. You can see it more close up. They're actually going in somewhere into the back there. They teleport in. They click on an SL URL. They rubble right in. And here's where they go. This is our welcome station for experiments. Now, that's one of my avatars, Professor Lax, named after the airport. <laughs> and I'm checking out the lab here. So you can see behind me there's a lab room, lab one. There's four labs. People would come in here. They were instructed to go to an open lab room. So you're thinking visually. You have to figure out where are the rooms. You look in the floor. There's things that get you there. As soon as I go in, the door shuts behind me. No one else can come in. And so someone else comes in and has to go to a different room. So you come into the um, lab. You sit down. So I'm sitting down here in front of the display device. This is a third person view. I'm looking at the um, regular sandwich at this point, or in the, another condition, I might see the word sandwich. Um, this is just to give you a sense of what it looked like. When the participants sat <coughs> down, um, the, the heads up display, the controls is actually adjusted into a first person view so that it looked from that first point on just like as much as possible what people in the web were doing. Okay, so you sit there, you go through the study just like you would on the web, except you're in Second Life. And when you're done, you walk out to the main area, there's this big safe, and if you've completed everything and you click the safe, 250 lender are deposited into your account, so you just made it all. <laughs> and this is good money for participating in research in Second Life. Okay, so that's a study where we're in the process of running other studies now using this system. This is the system we use to run the study that I'm talking about right now. Okay, quick results. Picture superiority. Pictures should be better recognized than words. Um, 
for sensitivity, this is how far apart the, the two distributions are. Um, people are more sensitive to pictures and words. We didn't get it for the decision bias. I'm not that concerned about it in this case. Most of the research has done results for sensitivity. Um, this is the second hypothesis, also this basic one. We should get better results if you have seen the slideshow where you see each of the images or text for one and a half seconds versus half a second. Yeah, that happens there. So this is just comforting that we're at least getting results that are sensible. Now the third hypothesis is an important one. This is the one that uh, is, is the driving um, uh, aspect behind the study. So this is the one where we, are, we actually are finding results for both of our measures that support our hypothesis. So if you look over here, this is for sensitivity. Are people more sensitive um, to uh, pictures in uh, text-based or image-based environments? We see that there, um, the, the sensitivity is higher for pictures when there's a mismatch. So pictures in the web are better remembered than pictures in the virtual world. Text, on the other hand, is better remembered in the virtual world than in the web. And we get the same thing with this decision bias, with this false, minimizing false memories, more conservative, more thoughtful approach. It happens when there's a mismatch. It happens in a mismatch for pictures, happens in a mismatch for words. So this basically supports that when you have this mismatch between how you think because of the environment and how you think because of the content, you do better with a simple recognition task. But, 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 but you still are more sensitive mm -hmm. to pictures, regardless yeah. of the image. For pic, maybe we have a picture superiority of that. Right. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so you still do, yeah. And, so yeah. 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 and we're seeing it here just on this one outcome and not on this outcome. Yeah. So you do remember pictures better. but. Given that you remember pictures better, you remember them <coughs> better if you see them on the web right, right, right. than in pictures. Okay. And then this, this hypothesis for A and B, I don't want to make too big a deal about this one, but this, um, this basically says that in the um, one and a half second condition, when you really um, had a chance to remember these things, the effect was, was, was very strong. In the half second condition, I don't know about you, but when I look at the half second thing, I don't know how people really get this right at all. But in front of here, people basically just do worse, and it doesn't really matter if it matches or mismatches. It's below this threshold. It's, it has to be enough of an impact to register. Once it does, then you get that effect, is what it's saying. If it's just going by too quickly, it, it's not going to matter if it matches or doesn't match. Okay. I, I just had a, um, a question about an alternative hypothesis. Yeah. Um, I bet you could probably rule out, but it, remember, it reminds me, your results remind me of um, the very first study you talked about with the high ceiling and the low ceiling, yeah. and that just that context can affect the way that you process information. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking here that um, the speed at which you're sent um, information, the way that you're looking at mm -hmm. information, can also influence the way that you, um, I mean, you might be more likely to say yes, 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 that I, I, I've seen something, just because something's moving faster. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering if you could, you know, that sensation uh, might account for your results and if there's some way to, to rule it out. One thing I have thought about is doing this maybe just uh, one condition where it's just a web environment that is, that is more visual versus a web environment that, that isn't. So that might take, and if that would completely take it out, but that might control for some of those things. Yeah. But we could, we could talk more. That's, yeah. that's, 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 a, that's a good thing to, to, to think about. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to get close to my time here. But I want to talk about one last little thing here. And then I have a conclusion. I have some brief implications for advertising here. Um, this idea of, of thinking styles, visual and verbal processing. Um, one of the things that we, we also did here is we developed some, uh, uh, some, some new scales for what we call situational visual and verbal encoding. So people, after they completed this task of whether or not they recognized the pictures of the words, they were asked to tell us how they, how, how, how they were thinking. So did you think um, by mentally picturing the content? Did you think in terms of words? So basically, did you think visually or verbally? So we developed these scales. They turned out pretty well for a couple items, but they turned out pretty well. And uh, what this basically tells us is that um, the idea is that uh, when we had this mismatch, it increased recognition. But we found that in that case, people told us they could use both of these ways of thinking equally. But overall, they didn't think that much. Uh, so the idea here is kind of paradoxical, but you think less, you remember more. When the content and context matched, things didn't work as well. People reported equally using visual and verbal processing. 
overall level, the level of visual and verbal processing was high, think more, remember less. So I rushed to this earlier, but this theory actually does support this that we have here. The fact that people are using both visual and verbal processing equally is consistent with this idea here that it's easy to switch back and forth. When you're not thinking much, it's easy to switch back and forth. So people are saying, yeah, I use both. On the other hand, this orange curve that I kind of gloss over, this is your memory performance. So it basically says when you have these low elaboration tasks, they're optimized for not thinking much. As you start to overthink, you do worse. And that's basically what this is saying here. People are overthinking, they think harder, and they do worse. So this kind of just supports uh, the theory a little bit. OK, study two. I only got one slide on it because it's not done. It's about to get into the field. The idea here is to predict a reversal. So now the match is going to be what makes things better. So um, in, in virtual world, where we found before people remember text, now we're going to try to have a situation where people remember picture images better. The real change is that um, when you are presented with a stimuli, you're then asked to categorize them. So it's not a fast slideshow now, but you're given a picture of a chair, and you're asked to categorize it organic or non-organic. Or, in another condition, you're asked to do much more thinking, asked to categorize into lots of different categories. So now, you're thinking a lot more about what you're seeing, and we're predicting in this case that a match of the content and the context is going to produce better results, not worse results. OK. So this leaves us with um, preliminary framework. It's preliminary because the whole second row here, the second row here hasn't been done yet, so it's preliminary. But contention upon getting these results, I think that a, kind of a nice way to think of a media environment is that we have a, a processing style that's induced by the context. Okay, so that can be either verbal or visual. And then within the context, you're inter interacting with content either in a low elaboration or high elaboration manner. Now, the low elaboration manner is what we can call incidental exposure. So you see these pop up online ads. Um, that's a, a a verbal context, a web browser, you see pop-up ads, that's incidental exposure. On the other hand, intentional exposure is when you're actually seeking out and engaging with the content to, to, to understand it. So that's a high elaboration uh, activity. So what we've done is kind of put different um, uh, media types into these four different categories. And let's take one example of each of these. And then there will be implications in terms of whether people remember images or words based upon whether a match or a mismatch would be theoretically predicted. So we have verbal content. We have web browser. We have incidental exposure. An example here would be Google Display Network. Now, you're probably all familiar with those Google contextual ads. But Google's, one of Google's latest products is their display ads, which are basically visual banner ads. And the display ads would predict it to be a mismatch and to be better remembered. OK, so and actually display ads about a week ago, Google stock went up 10% in one day because of the unexpectedly great performance of just Google display ads. Those have been really, really successful. So this predicts that in the verbal context, incidental exposure, mismatch, images, and better remembered. On the other hand, a visual context, like a game, you might have an in-game ad, have a billboard in the game. A mismatch, in this case, would be better, but since the context was visual, you'd remember the words better than the pictures in the game. Okay, now you start thinking more. You have intentional exposure. You have a verbal context like the Kindle. That's about as verbal as it comes, right? The Kindle is encouraging verbal processing. You have intentional exposure to some sort of advertisement or content you see. You're thinking about it. The match is going to be important here. You're going to remember things that are text-based, if you see it on the Kindle, more than you would image-based if you're elaborating on it, because that's how you, the thinking style is the same. Yeah, yeah. I got a little confused. Didn't you say that images always work better than words? Then why, um, maybe I just missed something that you said earlier. Um, I understand that in the web browser context that you uh, mm -hmm. you know, images can work better. But mm -hmm. you said that if images always work better than words, why would it work? Why would words work better than game time? 
Yeah. And that, that's actually a good point for here. I, I'm still thinking of this relatively. Um, I guess that there is the picture superiority effect for the recognition um, that may be the case that uh, with that, the picture still would be better recalled. When you're actually elaborating, though, it's not clear that that would be the case. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. That, that, but that up here, you're, you're right. With the, you have to still factor in the picture superiority effect. I'm kind of conveniently ignoring and saying relatively speaking. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 To make things mm -hmm. happen. Um, and then the last example here, um, a visual context. Um, this is one that I like. It's the Zugara Augmented Reality Shopping. Zugara is a local company in Southern California. They have this nice little product they developed. Like it's a uh, webcam uh, interface. So on your webcam, what she's doing is she's on her webcam, and she's touching with gestures objects, and then they're rendering in front of her. Right. So she's actually doing intentional exposure to the content. The content is visual content. Um, she's elaborating on it, and the environment is highly visual because she's in it. And so with, in this case, um, what you uh, this is uh, uh, this would predict that this would be really good for um, improving the memory of the images after she's elab elaborated on them by engaging with them. Okay. So that so just some examples of how this can be broadened beyond the second life and uh, uh, web browser context. So thank you. Exactly, is this, this have an impact on advertising? I mean, the presumption of recognition. How does that necessarily translate into effective advertising? I mean, I see it's a dependent variable that can be yeah. studied, but I'm not quite sure what its external validity is or its application. I mean, I, I think this will be at a very early stage in the process, with so something that's first being introduced, and you want to have people become aware of it. Um, recognition is important. Now, there's been a lot of other research. Most of the research actually in marketing and consumer behavior has looked at not at recognition, but at people's judgments or evaluations of these things. And in those cases, you often get kind of opposite results than recognition. But I think the implications for advertising are just basically that uh, you're just trying to get people aware of something. Uh, does it stick in their mind? That, that's part of the objective there. So it might be remembering a logo, remembering a brand name. In what circumstances so, would people wouldn't like it, to I mean, offhand, not my deal. Wouldn't offhand be more interesting to to assess recall than recognition? Like, you know, if you're trying to think of a category and that comes to mind, rather than recognizing it when you see it, which is what this is measuring. Mm -hmm. would re would, what would you predict about recall? Suppose you were asking, which I could see doing with the words. I'm not quite sure you do with the images, but you could say now, you know, write down all the words that you saw in that right. list. All the things you mm -hmm. saw. Yeah, all the things you, you would not be guaranteed to get the same results. It no, would not necessarily exactly. work in the same way. Well, yeah. you're interesting from the point of view yeah. of applying it to advertising. Yeah, no, I think that would. Um, recognition, I mean, practically, I mean, it's the. Uh, I mean, I can see how you can sell it to a clients mm -hmm. because it can be measured. And they can think, oh, that's good. But mm -hmm. it's not clear to me why it's good uh, beyond selling to clients. Mm -hmm. well, I think I could imagine just going to a store and look at all these products and thinking, oh, I recognize that one that I saw. Well, that would, to me would be what an empirical question. I'd like to see some, some evidence that that kind of uh, recognition actually changes your, your behavior. I can see the recall. I can, I can see in the sense that you're trying to think of a product and a name comes to mind. Like somebody asks you what kind of X do you want, the one that pops into your mind which isn't the same as recognizing it on the show. I, th I think one way it does come in is this idea of uh, false memories. Because people, uh, research has shown that people do have false memories. They kind of make things up. I don't know. False alarms, so I, mean, I get that. <laughs> you get plenty of, you get plenty. The other question I had was just one of the examples. Product placement. The implication of that is that if you're doing placement, like in a film or a television program, you do better with the, the text than with the, with a visual image, which is sort of an interesting challenge to implement in how you yeah. do it. Yeah. It's one thing to hold the Coke bottle, yeah. it's another thing to somehow get the... Well, well, the Coke bottle has the word on it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, That's what yeah. Mike, you sort of hold it up, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> which you see a lot. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they do. Is it the word? Or they can sort of do both in that case. Yeah. 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 
there's a lot more advertising on the web, and of course, I mean, the broadcasting that includes sound as well as words and images. Mm -hmm. uh, does sound fit into uh, your uh, uh, kind of work you're doing? Is it important or uh, interesting to include what the effect of sound is in terms of recognition? It, I mean, it could be. I mean, certainly you could actually hear the words instead in addition to reading them. Well, I mean, that's what you're certainly seeing yeah. in, in TV mm -hmm. messages and more and more on the web. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what and so I mean the idea of the context also being one that's predominantly um, auditory versus visual. Yeah, I mean that just reminds me of the new trend now where you, the advertisements um, volume goes up. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a guess, very old trend. Well, I, well yeah. it's going up these I guess the new trend now, is that now you the, the TVs are they're smart. Told, they're told they can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're told the FCC told them to stop doing it. But the, actually, VCRs used to use that. There used to be a, a thing yeah. built into a VCR that would cut out when the volume went up so that you could record something and cut out the commercials. They took advantage of that. They've been doing that forever. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. Forever. I think the one question that this suggests, though, is would mismatch, how would that work if you didn't, you know, like the Stroop test or something you did it. So you did an image and a word that weren't exactly the same. You know, the, the, that's to say, a spoken and, a, and an image. Right. By your account, in other words, if it said car, but you heard desk or something, mm -hmm. and then were asked which images you saw. Mm -hmm. By that account, by your account, you should do better when you had when you had the confusing mismatch. Mm -hmm. Think that would work? Yeah. That I'm not that's sure about. One, one thing we are doing is actually a third study in here too, is to show people um, an image and a word where they're actually they're, they're not the same. And so the idea then, this is a, not as strong of a test, I think, of what you're focusing on as if you would simultaneously see it's like a picture of a tree and then a, the word car. Mm -hmm. And then the question then is, what do you actually um, remember? But if these, we, we, these are, we, we have thought about this idea of recall and recognition, but we haven't really kind of uh, come up with a good theory yet of how it would differ for recall. But uh, there's a lot of directions this can go. There's this, uh, uh, the, 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 um, your attitude towards something that uh, it's a lot of a lot of ways this could, could proceed. Yes. I have a question um, about how you make decisions for, about acceptable levels of abstraction. Mm -hmm. So the images you used were not the same level of abstraction as Second Life, right? So mm -hmm. and um, similarly, when and the images in the real world were not photographs of mm -hmm. the real world, and right. um, and then similarly, kind of well, kind of relatedly, when they clicked on the images in Second Life, it wasn't that their avatar was physically manipulating things or the avatar was was working in the immersive world. So I'm curious how you like made decisions about acceptable levels of representation to mm -hmm. constitute a match. We did go back and forth about whether uh, the images um, should be images from Second Life or from the real world to also have this idea of whether the image was congruent. So you can have actually have a photograph that, uh, and, and this is a study we might still do too, but you would be thought you can have a photograph of like a Second Life vegetable versus a photograph of a real vegetable, right? right? And so the, the, the premise then is that uh, <laughs> it, now it's not really, um, um, a match of thinking style, but it's more of a match of substantially does this fit the Second Life environment, which, which I think um, you know, you, you we get the same sorts of predictions, not just because of thinking style, because the, like the, the Second Life vegetable should be better, uh, should actually be less better remembered in Second Life than the photos, and vice versa, because the Second Life vegetable is kind of blend in, whereas realistic pictures should be better remembered, and vice versa. Yeah. So is there then like a hierarchy or a range of of matchiness of different kinds of abstraction, I guess? There is. It gets complicated <laughs> because it's, it's the, the, um, we're just looking at the one layer of whether the right. thinking styles match. Mm -hmm. But I, I think a really interesting question would have to do with like pictures of avatars themselves versus real people, right? And so then it's not just do you remember them, but how do you like them? Uh, there's a lot of different evaluations you can make in terms of whether that matches or not. And so um, you know, beyond the issue of thinking style, there's the question of matching of 
is it a fit for Second Life versus a fit for real world in terms of the realism? And uh, you know, photographs in Second Life look ridiculous. They're realistic, but they don't. They look fake. It, it's weird. They they look artificial. Is it because they don't match? Yeah. I had a question about um, you know using brands and about how um, you know certain kinds of errors might mm -hmm. be desi actually desirable if you're the the. the um, brand leader in your mm -hmm. in your uh, in your category. Mm -hmm. So if you're Coca-Cola, yeah. you, know, you might want people to uh, the false positives. Yeah, false positives because yeah. you're the market leader. And so I was wondering if you've ever done any experiments where you've actually used brands and mm -hmm. looked at whether you see the same kinds of patterns for market leaders versus um, you know less known brands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. The false positive, I think, would be a kind of an advantage for anyone, particularly for a small entrant who wants to be confused then. <laughs> yeah, with a, with, a, with, a, with a larger one. Yeah. That's good. Dimitri? I'm sorry if I missed this at the beginning, but were you doing this in Second Life because you were interested in Second Life behavior because it was something that you hadn't been done offline or had already been done in, in the literature? <coughs> were these things already known? Or were you doing this? and nobody knew if it would work in any context. <clears throat> this aspect of uh, recognition, um, we really can't find any literature that really speaks directly to this question. Uh, so, so partly, as the, as this is a question that really is unaddressed. People have looked at mismatch and mismatch, but not from this perspective. And this is a pretty basic perspective, which we think has kind of gotten overlooked. For, for Second Life, the reason we picked Second Life is partly because I'm interested in Second Life, so I'm going to do the study in there. It also fits, but then it also, it, it does then, once we get these studies done, it gives us the opportunity to go with other aspects of it. So like with avatars um, versus photos, with you know, Second Life avatar names are not real names. I mean, they, they have a unique characteristic. So, um, so there's, there's a lot of ways this matching, this matching can be done within Second Life, because Second Life as a context, it's not just visual, it also has its own norms in terms of what people expect things to look like, what people expect things to be called, even brand names, there's brand names in Second Life, there's things that kind of fit there. I guess what, what, I'm, what I'm setting up is the extent to which you care about external validity, the extent to which you want this to be a test that would work in parallel to a real test yeah. or not. And uh, it, it's, it's a different goals here, right? You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you were to do this, I think you know you'd set up the, the parallel real world test, and if you have the same results, yeah. that would be pretty cool because it would mean that Second Life becomes a more viable platform to do these things. Mm -hmm. You get more confidence in the platform itself. As of right now, it's a Second Life specific result. Mm -hmm. As a you know journal reviewer, wherever I'm saying, I don't, yeah. I don't know if I can trust this yeah. to be real space. And I think that's where that last slide is going: is that there's other um, conditions beyond the virtual world and of all the real world. Now, as to whether we or someone else do that, and that question, I think, hasn't been determined. I don't know how, how much we can actually do in one subject, in one, pa uh, one paper. But I think that's, that's a good point. I mean, uh, but I think where, where we're going in that last slide is basically um, you'd like to have a broader uh, external validity. You'd like these things to be true. Um, whether we can do a study with billboards in the real world or things like that, I don't know. Um, but it, it definitely needs to be done to establish that. Yes. From the uh, advertising standpoint, you classify your audience as either being passive or active, mm -hmm. correct? In both the 2D world, um, both the 2D online world, as well as the visual world. Yeah. How are you able to distinguish whether or not your audience was actively thinking or passively thinking? I think I'm thinking of them more just basically definitionally, that if you, um, if, if you see something, you're not asked to react to it. You just like see the slideshow, you see something of, as you're driving by, uh, you see something on a billboard in a movie, it, it just, you're, you're passive. You didn't intend to see that, it, it happened to you, right? So it's, it's, it's incidental exposure, it just happened to you. On the other hand, if you actually seek something out or asked to do something with it, you're, you're by definition, you're active. You're, you're being asked to do something with that content. Like you're being asked to think, okay, this movie, what other movies is it like? So, so now you become active. <coughs> yes. Related to that, um, could you clarify the connection between um, match elaboration and intention because mm -hmm. elaboration like your theory has even the motivation component and the ability component so I'm thinking the intention corresponds to the motivation but what if people are for whatever reason like a visual graphics artist mm -hmm. um, is more primed or is more able somehow more prone towards images um, and you still have an incidental exposure mm -hmm. uh, would they still have a match 
with the higher match with the text, which is a mismatch in mm -hmm. a visual environment. It's because not not because of the emotive, not because of the tension, right. but because of their ability for whatever reason. Okay, so there's dispositional differences in people. Some people tend to think more visually. And if you have someone who's a, who's a graphic artist, then sometimes you have people who really at the stream ends, and then you have maybe a, a computer engineer on the other end who thinks you know, very um, uh, rationally, verbally. Um, in other research we've done, we've, we've done research on um, uh, thinking styles, where you think experientially or rationally, and so you're, you're asked to do a task that is uh, a creative task. So you have like a, a toy elephant, you're asked to think of all the different ways to make it more creative. Um, what we found is it's more like, really more how do you approach that task? Do you approach it creatively or do you approach it um, rationally? That's more important rather than your general tendency to do that. So your, your general tendency kind of predicts how you're gonna um, approach the task. It's kind of a weak prediction. It doesn't predict everything, it predicts some. But if you try to predict just from your tendency, it doesn't do a very good job. The tendency helps predict how you think, visually or verbally, and it's how you think that really seems to be um, operating. So I don't know if that quite gets at that. The, the dispositions kind of uh, influence how you think, but the dispositions by themselves aren't going to predict that things are well. I think they're, they're too nebulous or too, too far back. Okay, I think we're at the end of time, but time is around. <laughs> Uh, next week, we actually have two different sessions, one on Monday and one on Friday that are both practice sessions for NCA in San Francisco next month. So I really encourage you to come and uh, apply a t critical attention to your peers doing practice talks.